Oh, you can't count to a billion. You just can't. <laughs> you can count to some big numbers, like a uh, thousand. Oh, no problem. A million? Oh, look at you go. But a billion? Nah, at least if you're counting out loud, there is no way you're gonna be able to count to a billion. It would take just too long. I mean, think about it. The smaller numbers are pretty easy to get through if you think about it. One, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 blah. But the larger numbers, it's gonna start taking longer and longer, like 5,326,101 Dalmatians. It's gonna take a lot longer, especially if you can't remember what numbers sound like. So looking at a post on Reddit, I averaged out my time from saying smaller numbers, like one, two, three, four, with larger numbers, like 101 Dalmatians, and you get a time on average that it takes you to say the average number, and then you multiply all that by a billion, and you get how long it would take for you to say out loud from one to a billion, and you get about 97 years without stopping. That means if you're not eating, sleeping, you're doing nothing other than counting, it would still take you 97 years to count all the way up to a billy billy. But this 97 year figure doesn't even factor into having a real life, needing to sleep, needing to eat, needing to take care of things and familial relations. What? No. No, I can't talk right now. Yes, I know the boy needs training, but I must count 704. 700 and, I don't know, sorry, 750. How does counting work? Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and I count them up on YouTube and all the other platforms and I address them here with the dexterity of who, perhaps, and then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, <laughs> I object. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are going through a few faster than light asterisk phenomena that can apparently break the universal speed limit. We are talking about non-information, non-material based things that could go faster than 300,000 kilometers per second. And then we went through the math of creating a totally not evil light speed guillotine. I think it's pretty cool and we could do it, but what did you have to say? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Our first comment comes from Carrie Noir, who says, if we can construct uh, one of these guillotines with the current technology, as you said, could they be used as countermeasures to either nukes or rods from God? Would cutting a nuke in midair be dangerous or would radiation spread faster? Also, would cutting a hypothetical rod midair redirect it? Keep up the good work, love the show. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Carrie, I like where your head's at, using a high-speed guillotine to cut missiles apart in midair. So let's just say that these guillotines have the kind of directional control that they would be effective. I definitely don't think they would be effective in this way, but let's just say that they are. If you cut a nuclear weapon, a nuclear missile in this way, it would be effective. Nuclear bombs are constructed such that they need a lot of things to happen all at once and in a precise way to ignite the nuclear reaction, whether that be fission or fusion. So in, say, a fission bomb, a plug of fissionable material has to be shot with like a bomb gun into the rest of the bomb to have the chain reaction go off in just such a way. So if you were to just cut the bomb in half or attack the engines or just disassemble it in flight, the nuclear bomb wouldn't go off in a nuclear-like reaction and it would spare some kind of destruction. So yes, guillotine versus nuke. That sounds fun. In a theoretical way. Theoretical. Amon Kadimela says, my dad saw me watching this video and asked why Thor was making sciencey videos. I ask your father, why not? <laughs> Tell your dad I said hi. That's a weird thing to say. Hey dad, some guy on the internet said hello. Huh? Internet? You mean ARPANET? Joe Grubb says, about halfway through the video, you're starting to sound a bit like a flat earther there, Kyle. Be careful. Well, I guess he's saying that because I was talking about a change in perspective as the rest of the universe rotating around Earth and not Earth going around the sun or what have you. <laughs> but there's no way I could be sounding like a flat earther in that video because I was using geometry and math correctly. <laughs> it's okay. They're not watching. They're posting in all caps on Facebook. Yeah, come at me. Get in a plane. See the curvature of the Earth on your way. <laughs> and then end up wherever I am. Ooh. Nacho Problem says, I can't unsee that the Because Science logo is inside of an upended triangle resembling a, a super V for villain. It was there the whole time. What? <laughs> you think I, me, 
would have the foresight when creating a new channel for this show to include a super villainy kind of Easter egg years down the line that you would lean into and yeah, no, it's some guy named Nacho. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think it'd be impossible to swim in a lot of cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're gonna drop a lot of cheese from one of those fire helicopters. He won't see it coming. <laughs> What's that? No, we won't have to deal with it. It's Nacho problem. <laughs> Love you. Oh, sorry. I was just ordering nachos from Grubhub. You know, next comment comes from T Lizard, who, which is Kermit the Frog with an infinity gauntlet, which I really like, who says, you have really nice expressive eyebrows. Makes a lot of your jokes hit a lot better. I appreciate them. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh yeah. Here's the thing. I learned to move my eyebrows independently from Ace Ventura pet detective movies. I watched Jim Carrey a lot when I was a kid and then I made the conscious decision to try to learn how to move them eyebrows. And then I watched Amelia Clark in Game of Thrones and then it's just better when you're talking if you can be more expressive with your face and your emotions then you look like a Disney character and then you ruin the last few episodes of your show. I mean, not personally. What were we talking about? James Moore asks, how many people would you could, uh oh. How many people could you behead with a space guillotine at once with it? So many. You know, I bet with how massive the space guillotine would have to be and how fast it was going, you'd, you could probably line up every single person on the planet and behead them all. Theore theoretically speaking, I wouldn't know the numbers on that. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Anarchy Engineer, who says something similar, and hey, we're talking about guillotines this episode, so why not? With the faster than light guillotine, would you say it's going fast enough that if you unfortunately got in the way, you wouldn't actually feel anything? This is an interesting physiological point, and it's something that's always brought up in the context of guillotines. When someone is beheaded by a guillotine for whatever reason, we've always been fascinated by, well, are they still conscious? Could they blink and signal to scientists or what have you? And if the faster than light guillotine was cutting through your body at faster than light, which it's not really going faster than light, of course, only the point of contact is, but it's still going many kilometers per second, I do believe that it would be traveling so quickly that it's probably faster as it goes through you, the nerve impulses can tell your brain that something hurts or something is bad. And there is some speed at which you could be incapacitated, let's say, that you will not know, you would not feel it happening. There is so little time delay between the event and you ceasing to be that you're not experiencing anything. So I suppose if you wanted to be the most humane you could possibly be with a guillotine, You'd want to put rockets on it? Is that where we ended up? Well, anyway, for making me think about that, Anarchy Engineer, you are indeed a super nerd. Ha! Oh, and an honorable mention I gotta give to Eric Janes, who is coming up with a lot of interesting void cannon on his own. Can I say if any of it's right? No. But I like it. But of course, I'm not always right. A lot of people pointed out in last week's episode that I said algebra. Like, I don't know how to say the word. Sometimes you gotta speak fast, and sometimes you're wrong. And most of the time, we don't have an extra take to use. So what did I get, <laughs> so what did I get wrong last week? Our first correction comes from Felix Moffat, who says, uh, Kyle calculates very complicated equation like it's nothing. He also says, as the sun rotates. Yes, I did make a mistake here, and like I said, sometimes we do not have the production time to go back and change something before something goes out. So yes, I meant to make the day-night cycle happen. The earth and not the sun has to rotate. That's an obvious mistake. That's only like a flat earther would make. <laughs> it's okay. Again, they're not listening. They're reblogging really poorly thought out posts. Chris Hamilton has a correction. Wouldn't cutting something that fast, like 18 kilometers per second with a giant space guillotine, cause an explosion? Well, yes, what we're kind of leaving out of all of this not super villainy calculation is that if you had a blade passing through something this fast, the blade necessarily has to be very, very robust, very hard, able to hold an edge, and it needs to be passing through a material that doesn't offer significant resistance to it. Many of you in the comments say, oh, could we use like a space guillotine to cut 
and chop through asteroids if they were headed to Earth, for example. Well, maybe, but asteroids are full of a lot of metal and they're mostly rock and metal. And if you just had a metal guillotine, it might not do the job because the guillotine might fail or break or crack or what have you. So in practical terms, if you made like a space guillotine, as I was imagining it, just rockets with a big slab of metal, it would probably destroy itself on impact with something, but that depends on what it's going through. It could cut a giant hunk of space butter. Mmm, space butter. Roffle has a correction who says, if light is the fastest thing in the universe, how come darkness got there before light? Ooh, <laughs> think about it. Well, that sounds like a fun kind of philosophical question, Roffle, but I will counter your correction with a question of my own. Before anything existed, could there have been darkness for nothing to be in with that which is nothing? Hmm, yeah, think about that. By which I mean before the Big Bang happened, if there was nothingness, then there isn't true darkness. There isn't an absence of light in a space because there's nothing to be an absence of. James Neve has a fundamental correction who says, but if reference points like the intersection between a blades of scissors moving along, if reference points are moving faster than light, how is information not moving faster than light? Well, this is the distinction that we have to make. Is information really being transferred when we're just tracking the position of two intersecting points? So while, for example, you could look at the intersection of scissor blades and you could track that point along an axis and you could at every point say it is cut or not cut, you could think about some way to transfer that information further down along the line that a point before it is not cut, for example. But think about what you would need to do to transfer that information. The point may be cut in fact, but to tell some point further down uh, along the line, you would need some way to transfer that information. And the only way you could do that is through mechanically transferring the information, which can only travel at the speed of sound through that material or luminally uh, transferring that information, say with like a radio broadcast or something which can only move at the speed of light. This is an illusion. The reference point itself is moving, but it contains no information as it moves. When it gets to the end, there is nothing that you can interpret from that reference point that would give you any indication of, you know, say binary back down the line or anything like that. So it's an illusion. We're not breaking relativity here. I didn't stumble on that. That would have been Nobel Prize worthy. But the dirtiest correction and super villainy kind of plot that I found in last week's YouTube comments, I have to give to Rocket Crazy, who says, regarding the non-diabolical, thank you, 100 meter knife, consider the type of knife. Suppose you were some billionaire and you were able to fabricate some kind of knife from diamond with a compressive strength quite necessary for the amount of stress the blade will be undergoing while cutting. If you had some malicious intent to destroy humanity, what better way than to suffocate all of them slowly? At the speed of seven square kilometers per second of trees chopped, it would take approximately 66 days or a little over two months to chop all of the trees in the world. Congratulations, you've lessened the Earth's O2 production by 30%. Air quality is significantly less and some life has died. Oh, cat, here. I have no doubt that with a rocket power guillotine, you could do some very dangerous and destructive things if it was moving fast enough and it was robust enough to move through millions and millions of trees. So rocket crazy, you are indeed crazy and a super nerd. Yeah! RIP headphone users. Now, moving right along to this week's episode of Because Science. This week's episode is a bit out of our comfort zone, but it's still interesting. It is, is the Joker criminally insane? That's right, in this week's episode, we are looking into actual case law and trying to determine whether or not the famous Joker, the clown prince of crime, can really use the insanity defense and end up in a place like Arkham. I know it doesn't sound very sciencey when you think about it at the start, but we do get into some things that make you wanna go, It's gonna be fun. But before we put the Joker on trial, please go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet all about making a faster than like guillotine and leave me all of your best nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram, and whatever the other thing is. And don't forget, the only way to prove me wrong about that billion thing is to start right now. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. 
Und...